Hello everyone and welcome to a new video in the Sewing Through the Decade series. If you're unfamiliar with this series, I will have a playlist with all of these videos linked up above, as well as the introduction. The short way to describe this project is that I'm sewing my way through the 20th century using original vintage patterns from each decade as a guide. And I'm starting off with 1900. I've actually already followed one pattern from this decade, which is a skirt pattern patented in 1908 by the McCall Pattern Company. The pattern I'm going to be following in this video is for the blouse waist I'm currently wearing. And this is actually also based on a McCall's pattern, specifically pattern number 2131. Unfortunately, this was never patented, so it doesn't have a date listed on it, but I believe it to be from around 1903 or 1905. The number 2131 is lower than the number for the skirt pattern, which means it predates that by quite a bit. So because of this, I did have to alter the silhouette a little bit, though I still followed the pattern and all of their instructions the same way I would have, regardless of what foundations I was wearing this over. It's just that the end result doesn't look quite the same since I'm wearing a different style of corset. This pattern is for ladies blouse waist without lining and with deep armholes and it originally came in six sizes though the size I have is for a 34 inch bust which is why it says 34 inches at the top. This pattern comes with almost double the amount of instructions as the skirt pattern, which I'm glad for since it was significantly more complicated to piece together. Much like with the skirt pattern and other patterns I've followed in this series, there's quite a bit you have to do between the steps they actually list, so there are definitely more than 11 simple steps that go into creating this. But the construction wasn't too difficult, however I do have some gripes with this pattern since I think they neglected to notch the tops of the sleeves and the cuffs, which made piecing those together require a lot of guesswork, and I'm pretty sure I guessed wrong, so I'm already itching to re make this and thinking of ways I could improve upon it, but I have another nine or so decades to get through before I can do that. Regardless of the issues I ran into, I really hope you enjoy seeing me piece this pattern together. The pattern for this project is one I was most nervous to use since it was factory folded and clearly hadn't been touched since its creation 110 years ago. But I was determined to use it so I eventually forced myself to open it up. The envelope had deteriorated badly but the tissue paper was in like new condition. It's amazing how well this thin paper has survived. This pattern is labeled as a blouse waist and is number 2131. It is listed as patent pending without a specific date. It has 9 pieces and 11 steps that go into constructing it. Like most patterns in the first quarter of the 20th century, this pattern is unprinted and pre-cut to a specific size, which in this case is size 34, which is the suggested bust measurement in inches for this size. Instead of using ink to mark the pieces, they used an assortment of perforations to indicate pleats, seam allowances, grain lines, and fold lines. Since this pattern was factory folded, these perforations were undamaged and easy to make out, which was a refreshing change from some of the other projects in this series. In terms of fabric, I really went back and forth with which material to use, but I eventually settled on this striped cotton for the body of the garment and a textured white cotton to use for the yoke and cuffs. Edwardian blouses were usually made from very, very light fabrics, which don't tend to have a lot of texture, which means seaming details don't show up particularly well. Which is such a shame since that is part of what makes this pattern beautiful. So that's why I decided to use two different fabrics just to break the design up and add some contrast. I also bought white and black buttons for this piece and didn't figure out which ones to use until much later on. The first three steps listed on the pattern all have to do with the yoke, so I made that my primary focus and cut it out first. The back of the yoke must be cut on a fold, as indicated by the three cross perforations on the edge of the pattern, and the front is cut from two regular layers on the vertical grain line. These pieces, along with the collar and cuffs, were cut from the white textured cotton which was backed with interfacing to give it more structural integrity. The yoke pieces will all be pleated, which is why they have that weird jagged lightning bolt sort of thing going on at the hem. After pleating, these will form a smooth slope. With the yoke cut out, it was time to transfer all the perforations on the pattern to the fabric. The small double circular perforations indicate pleat points, and they kindly marked these inside the seam allowance so I could use a pencil to mark them without having to worry about it showing later on. The pattern instructions say, box pleat. Fold right yoke at double circles OO and stitch 3 eighths of an inch away from the folds, catching the front edge in with the second stitching. Which really confuses me because that isn't a box pleat, that is a pin tuck. And when doing this on the back panel, they called a tuck. So why they chose to refer to it as a box pleat here, I'm not sure. I should also read step two and three since I'm doing them all at once here. Step two is hem, turn under front edge of left yoke one and three quarters inches. And step three is tucks, fold at single small circles and stitch three eighths of an inch from fold. 
So what I actually did was fold the material at the perforation points and iron over top of it to set the crease. I repeated this for all the perforation points except for the ones at the front. For those, I straight up folded the front edge inward like they said to do in step two. I pinned a quarter inch or so away from all the folds and I found it much easier to iron all the folds into position before pinning them. Now over to the sewing machine. Like they instructed, I sewed 3 eighths of an inch away from all of the creases, removing the pins as I went. These were all ironed outward, so they do kind of resemble box pleats, but they definitely aren't. You aren't fooling me, McCall's circa 1905. Step four says, extension, lap extension of back over front to small circles. And then it wants me to sew that to the yoke. But like with a lot of historical patterns, there are a few steps in between that that I had to make up first. So before following steps four and five, I decided to sew the yoke pieces together at the shoulder as notched. This isn't mentioned in any other steps, but obviously has to be done. After sewing, the seam was thoroughly ironed. I also decided it would be easier to attach the collar now rather than later on, and they never mentioned sewing on the collar, so I'm assuming that is up to me. I cut the collar out twice from the same white cotton, and I also cut out the cuffs for the sleeves. The collar pieces were pinned together with the right sides facing each other. Then I sewed across the top and side edges with a half inch seam allowance, and turned it right side out. I'm not sure where the footage of me sewing this is, but here you can see me ironing it. And the collar was sewn on with a half inch seam allowance as well. Surprisingly, there weren't any notches indicating how this should go on, so I just did my best to ease it around the neckline by eye. I also top stitched the seam allowance under the yoke panel so it wouldn't be visible when worn. If I made this again, I would definitely line the yoke portion to completely hide this raw edge. But this was specifically marketed as a pattern without lining, so I made do with this. Now I cut out the remaining pieces from the striped fabric, or at least most of them. This pattern has a few different collar and cuff options, and I obviously didn't need all of them. Their cutting instructions were, to cut, arrange neckband with edge having three crosses on crosswise fold, other pieces with three crosses on lengthwise fold, and remaining pieces with larger O's lengthwise on the material. For the most part, I followed this, but I hated the way the stripes formed over the shoulder extension, so I ended up cutting that pattern out diagonally so the stripes would sit straight over the shoulder instead of awkwardly cut off. Though none of the other pieces were pleated, there were still perforations to be marked on the fabric. On the sleeves, I had to mark where the gathering began and ended, and on the bodice pieces I had to mark the extension placement, the center front, as indicated with four large circles, the waistline slash shearing point, and probably some other stuff that I'm forgetting. The shearing points had to be marked on the back panel too, and as you can see I had to add a seam to the back of this panel since I cut it out on the bias instead of the fold to get the stripes to sit in a more flattering manner. So step four is extension. Lap extension of back over front to small circles. And this is referring to the lap shoulder detailing on the bodice. They don't mention this step, but I took it upon myself to turn all the edges inward before doing this. I did this by eye, aiming to turn them all inward by a half inch, but they do have perforations marking the seam allowance, which you could transfer to the fabric and use as a guide if you wanted. I also decided I wanted to define this detail by trimming the arrow-shaped edges with a contrasting material. Unfortunately, the shirting I was using was too thin to support piping. It also wasn't opaque enough that I could get away with using black edging. The shadow of it under the seam allowance would have been visible. So instead, I cut a few narrow strips of the white shirting, then ironed them in half. These were folded, pinned, and sewed to match the angle of the arrows on the bodice. Then I pinned them together so a quarter inch or so of the white edging was visible from the front. And now I could finally pin the lap extension. The perforations of the pattern actually marked where these should overlap, so it was really easy to line up. I sewed these together from the front using top stitching that was a quarter inch or so away from the folded edge. Then I carried that stitching down to secure the folded edge at the back of the neckline. But this was made completely unnecessary after a later step, so I shouldn't have done this. On to step five, which is called joining. It says, join front and back to yoke as notched. So I laid the two pieces out upside down and matched up the raw edges and notches. I used a few pins to roughly position it from the back, then flipped it over and pinned it more thoroughly, since that's the side I'll be sewing on. I learned this trick from another pattern in this series, and it's great, just remember to take out the pins on the underside first. Otherwise things can get a little messy when sewing. Also, I noticed that the yoke had a bit too much volume to perfectly line up with the bodice. 
So there are a few tiny puckers at the back, which is unfortunate but unavoidable if you want to line up the notches. These are secured together with top stitching, and I actually began the top stitching at the bottom of the panel, so it secures the edges I ironed inward earlier, as well as the yoke and bodice together. This method of stitching also makes the stitching around the back that I did earlier on completely unnecessary. So step six involves shearing, but I decide to sew in the closures first. For this, I used a mixture of extra small snaps, small snaps, and hooks and bars. I'm also using the black buttons, but they are just for decoration. I used a small snap to secure the top of the overlapping portion at the front, and an extra small snap a few inches below that. A hook and bar closure was placed at the waistline, and I alternated hooks and extra small snaps on the yoke. The reason I used a mixture is because hooks and snaps have different strengths. I think snaps keep things flatter, which is nice, but are weaker when tension is put on the fabric. Where hooks are pretty strong when it comes to tension, but can actually become undone when something is looser and there isn't tension keeping it together. So I used hooks where I knew there would be tension, like at the top of the yoke and at the waist, and snaps everywhere else. Snaps are also way nicer to sew on, at least in my opinion. I also sewed on buttons so my garment would look more like the one in the display picture. Now onto the shearing. Shearing is the act of gathering material with a string, or gathering material with several rows of parallel stitching, or a combination of the two. Their instructions of this are, shear a long cross line of large circles and sew stays under shearing. They don't explain what they mean by stays, nor do they show it anywhere on the pattern, and Google wasn't super helpful either, so I chose to ignore that. To create the shearing, I pinned rectangles of lightweight cotton across the marks they mentioned. These were cut on the bias to better form the curved markings, and had the edges turned inward so they wouldn't fray. I sewed these on with one row of stitching very close to either edge, and another row of stitching a quarter inch away from those stitches to create two separate parallel channels for the ribbon. I threaded a very large blunt needle with ribbon, then threaded it through the channels until the ribbon came out of the other side. This was repeated for all of the channels. The ribbon I was using for this was a little thicker than what would be ideal, and the needle I used wasn't that blunt, so I had some trouble with it catching on the fabric and difficulties getting the ribbon through. So I had to bring the pliers out for parts of this, but I did eventually get it done. I tied the ribbon at the back to keep the gathering there a standard width at all times, but I left the ribbons loose at the front so it is somewhat adjustable. They don't mention this part either, but I thought sewing the side seams was an important step, so that's what I'm doing here. Fun factoid about this pattern, the perforations indicate a one inch seam allowance here, but if you do that, the arm size is too small for the sleeves. That isn't a frustrating thing to find out at the end of this project at all. Though it is actually quite frustrating indeed, as I discovered when making my mock-up. <laughs> I decided to hem the bodice too. I had planned on stitching lace binding to the bottom edge, then turning the edge inward, but the binding extended too wide and when turned inward the hem looked clunky. So I ended up leaving the binding visible since it looked kind of pretty and matched the colors in the bodice. But in hindsight I would have done a rolled quarter inch hem. It would have looked way better and been easy to do with this material. Now onto the sleeves. Step eight was cut off at small circles for shorter sleeves, which I did, well, kind of. I actually traced the pattern piece onto new paper, then cut it off since I didn't want to damage the original pattern. I'm still very protective over it at this point. Then step eight was gather between double crosses, which I'm doing by hand with running stitches pulled taut. Once I was done and the thread had been tied off, I pinned the side seam. I also pinned the side seam for the cuffs, or the base cuff, depending on what you want to call it. These were sewn with half inch allowances. Then they were ironed. Step 9 is terminate seam at extension, which sounded very dramatic but didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. The only thing I could think of it meaning is to remove the additional fabric from the underside of the overlapping shoulder seam, so that is what I did. Now it was time to finish the turned back cuff. Their instructions on this were regarding sewing it on, but before doing that I folded the top edges inward and stitched them down. I made the cuffs from an interfaced cotton, but they were still pretty light. In hindsight I should have lined them with something really stiff and lined the cuff base too. The cuffs ended up flopping down or wrinkling when this was worn and not looking very nice at all. The cuffs were also sewn together according to the notches. 
and the cuff bases were sewn onto the gathered edge of the sleeves. This is the other part I regret not lining with something stiffer. Now I sewed the turn back cuff to the cuff base. This part was really annoying. Their instructions were, sew to plain cuff 3 eighths of an inch above small circle and turn back cuff at this seam. So basically just sew on with a 3 eighths of an inch seam allowance. But there were no notches or any indication of how to position the cuff so it would turn out in the direction shown in the garment display picture. They have notches on the plain cuff, but none on the asymmetrical cuff where the direction actually matters. It was so annoying. The instructions for the sleeves were equally bad. They say place seam at notch in front and notch in top of sleeve at shoulder seam. That doesn't sound bad, except there were no notch in the front of the sleeve or arm side, and there is no discernible shoulder seam since it is a lapped seam. I think they probably use the same instruction for all their shirt slash blouse patterns, it just doesn't suit this style due to the shoulder detailing, and the notches for this pattern were all cut by hand, so I'm guessing they forgot to cut the ones around the arm side which I can understand, but meant I had no reference point for how to sew the sleeves in. So I decided to line the bottom seam up with the side seam of the shirt, since this is how the patterns from 1915 and 1920 directed me to do it. But this side seam in this shirt is set really far back, which means the sleeves don't sit properly at all. They twist when worn and the cuff is positioned much closer to the center than it should be, since the whole sleeve is sewn off center. I didn't really notice this until the day of the photo shoot, so it is visible in all the photos. And that was it in terms of following this pattern. I did end up adding a bow since they show one in the pattern image and I felt like this design needed one, but I did that off camera. My final thoughts towards this project are frustration and disappointment. As I said in the beginning, this pattern was in such amazing condition and I was so excited to construct it. I don't think many people get the opportunity to follow a paper pattern that hasn't been touched since its creation a century ago. I wanted to do it justice, and I don't think I did, but I don't think it was my fault either. Most of the problems have to do with the sleeve and cuff placement, which I was sewing on blind without reference. However, there are issues with the fabric structure at the cuff, which is my fault, and the shearing sits way too high at the back of the bodice, which I should have noticed with my mock-up. Overall, it is one of my least favorite pieces from this project so far. But I do like how it looks when paired with this amazing hat, which I based on styles from a Butterick catalog, and the wool skirt based on another early 20th century McCall's pattern. I think it makes a striking, somewhat convincing ensemble despite its faults. I do eventually want to make a costume spotlight on this piece, and I'm wondering if I should remake the blouse first, maybe with the thicker fabric, contrasting piping, lower shearing at the back, and a better sleeve setting. Or maybe I'll get lazy and just reset the sleeve and redo the hem and call it done. I'd love to hear your thoughts, and on that note, I'm going to end this video. Thank you so much for watching, I really hope you enjoyed. If you did and would be interested in seeing more content, I hope you'll subscribe, and maybe consider checking out my Patreon, it helps support this series in future projects along with giving you access access to lots of behind the scenes content, including my attempt at a mock-up for this piece. Thanks again for watching, I shall talk to all of you very soon.